family, Sister Shanice in the house. We are live for another Wednesday show. I want to welcome each and every one of you. I'm absolutely delighted, as always, uh, to have the opportunity to be speaking with you, our wonderful, fantastic, blacktastic audience. And oh, don't we have a great show lined up for you today? Yes, uh, we have our very special guest our phenomenal uh, historian, archaeologist in the house, none other than Dr. Clyde Winters. Yes, yeah, so he's going to be coming to us uh, very shortly, family. So uh, hold your horses, get your water, get your notepads, because you know it's going to be a roller coaster of a session. And, uh, you know, it's always a privilege, always a privilege. So as you come in the door, please do uh, let me know that you are in the house. Hey, what a good show. What an inter interesting one and controversial show for some is going to be as well. So uh, family, today's topic is going to be Black Muslims in the West Indies part one. Now we have a lot of family members here who are of the Caribbean descent from the West Indies region, the so-called West Indies. So this in this uh, session is going to be particularly uh, interesting for you, I'm absolutely sure. So uh, yeah, come through the door, give us a big up, <laughs> rise up, rise up. And uh, I want to thank all of you who were tuned in to my radio show earlier today. Uh, on the Big G Galaxy, Afiwi, the only de-brainwashing station. And wow, what a show it was. What a controversial discussion we were having on our show today. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit of the discussion with you. And then we're going to ask Dr. Clyde to add to the discussion. And I think he's going to bring even more controversy into the mix. So uh, get ready, get ready for this one. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Clyde. We are honored to have you in the house. <laughs> How are what you? Up, what up, though? What up, though? How you doing? Oh, very well, thank you. It's always such a privilege to have you on this platform. My audience love you. You thank know, you. they said, they said, we want, get Dr. Clyde, get Dr. Clyde to come back. So I said, okay, I'll try. I know how busy he is. And uh, yeah, you've responded to the call. We thank you so much. <laughs> I can't, uh, I can't say no to you. You know, that hell. Oh, I cannot oh. say no. I cannot. <laughs> family, family. <laughs> Blame it on this woman being an oracle. Do you know what an oracle is, family? An oracle. In the old days, you would go to you would go to a special village. It would be a it would be a hut all by itself. You would go to that hut, and inside they would have this woman sitting. And this woman, in a sense, you would come and ask her questions. And then when you asked her questions, she gave you answers. And that's what that's who that's who we got here. You know, wow. even though even though the only problem. The only problem with uh, Shanice is that Shanice doesn't know she's giving out super answers. <laughs> no. so that makes it a little bit difficult. Oh, we just lost a bit of your lighting. Uh, yeah, there. I know. I don't know why. Oh, nice. No, yeah, I there think, it is. I think, uh, I think sometimes it's, an, uh, I think it's another bean here in this house. But oh, anyway. it's the being that gives you all that knowledge and wisdom that you have. Oh, my gosh. You I don't know about me. that. I spent a lot of time sage in the house. I spent a lot of time sage in the house. Yes, yes, yes. You know. Oh, family, family. I was having a bit of a conversation uh, with our beloved uh, Dr. Clyde backstage. And I was saying, Dr. Clyde, how many books have you written so far? Guess how many books he's written so far, family? No less than 40. 40 books. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Dr. Clyde, I wonder if you can maybe give us just a few of the titles of some of those books that our, re our, our avid uh, students who are interacting today can actually go away and, and um, read and use for uh, them. You know, uh, the, Mandy, uh, the Mandy Influence in Ancient America. I'm going to tell you the truth. Unless I get prepared, I can't remember all that stuff. There's <laughs> too many of them. <laughs> yeah, see, see, that's why See, that's why I miss my wonderful one. My wonderful one, she was she was my roller deck. She 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 did the memory stuff for me. She remembered oh. things. See, I what I what I do in a sense is that, you know, it's 
I just I just get involved in stuff. Like my latest book was The Sioux Empire. And the Sioux Empire, it's about what it is, is it's a book about it's a book about the uh an empire that existed in uh in the Nile Valley. And uh mm -hmm. the Sioux Empire, what it was is that it was uh it was led by by Pharaoh Pharaoh Nahisi. And the and the Sioux Empire Nahisi was also ruling Egypt, but while he was ruling Egypt, he was also ruling the Sioux Empire that, that extended all the way into Mesopotamia. Get that book on the Sioux Empire. Then my other book that I'm really I'm really proud of is Pathfinder. And Pathfinder is my memoir, and I talk about how I became the researcher I am today. So mm -hmm. I like Path, I like Pathfinder. A recent book I wrote was yeah, The Soul of Islam. And The Soul of Islam is a book about about Muslims over here in the Western Hemisphere, you know. Uh, back in the day, back in the day, I um, back in the day I said I was a Muslim. I don't say I'm I'm any religion now because I just believe in God because I feel that I feel that religions divide us. I feel mm -hmm. that it's it's through these it's through our varied religions that allow us to be divided. So I don't claim any religion. I just believe in God. Mm -hmm. But the book is called The Soul of Islam. Nice. And then okay. I discuss. Yeah. Give us a little, it, little bit of an insight into that, the soul of Islam. Oh, really interesting title there. Okay, well, what, what it was is that uh, back in the day, um, back in the day, I used to, I used to feel that I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, to make, to make certain people's history known. Okay. So mm -hmm. since, uh, since back in the 80s, a lot of people was becoming Muslims, they were following Malcolm X and things like that. So then I started writing uh, books on on uh, the history of Islam in America, how how the Muslims came over from Africa. They introduced what was called the Malinki Fiqh. It was a lot of Fiqhis here. Fiqh is an, uh, a Fiqh is a is a learned a learned Muslim. Many of the uh, Muslims that came over here, they got they could speak Arabic and they and they rewrote the entire Quran from memory. Oh wow! Uh -huh. Not just here. They did the same thing in the Caribbean. These mm -hmm. these brothers, you know, they they started school at eight years old. By the time they by the time they got to be uh, a teenager, they already in a sense knew the Quran by heart, you know. Wow, wow. And so then uh, there's many examples of it. And then like down in uh, so I started writing about the Muslims in America, you know. Then mm -hmm. I said, hey, if it was Muslims in America, what about the Caribbean? So I wrote about Muslims in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And then and then I uh, I wanted to write on Muslims in Brazil, so I had to learn Portuguese. So I had to learn Portuguese. Wow. And then wow. I found in the sense that in in, in Brazil, these mm -hmm. Muslims they even had their own universities around the country. Mm -hmm. And wow. and they had uh they had a lupus, they had a lot of uh, Muslim scholars. In fact, you know, uh uh people would travel around the country to go to the best teachers. And this mm -hmm. is in Brazil. But uh mm -hmm. we don't we know about them in 1835 because that's when they had one of their last great jihads. See, the thing about Muslims is that. If you're a real righteous Muslim, you always had to tell the enemy you were at war with him. So to me, that was, I think, I, I, I don't know, I learned from the white man. You don't tell me just going, ugh, fuck <laughs> him up, baby. But, uh, so that was it. And uh, so, and then, uh, then after that, I started, uh, I started writing on Islam in China for about, oh. yeah, for about 10 years. I was the only expert in the world on Islam in China, the Muslims of China. Now they got a lot of, now, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, I was the uh, expert. I used to get invited to a lot of conferences. I used to get a lot of free air trips, you know what I mean? And, oh, nice, yes. Yeah, because, uh, you know, having six children and a wife, that doesn't give you too much money to fly, but because of the fact that I was the, uh, the expert on Islam in China, I got invited to a lot of conferences, yes. you know. And uh, then, uh, then uh, some American went over there from Harvard, and uh, I revisited, then they said, they'll go ask the white boy, you know. So, I mean, hey, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I'm not upset about it. But the thing is, this is that. So that's how I got interested in uh, writing about Islam and, and Islam throughout the Americas. And in my book, The Soul of Islam, I talk, mm -hmm. about, I talk about the role of Islam. Even uh, even I talk about its role in condomblis, condomblis you know, the, uh, the uh, so-called Afro-Latino Afro religions. It always has, it has an element of Islam there, you know. Oh, yeah. interesting. Okay, so that's a book to get if you're interested in hearing more about the Islam and the soul yeah. of Islam. 
get the book by Dr. Clyde, one of 40 books that he has written. And you've also written over 100 scholarly articles that have been submitted and cited on numerous occasions. I was reading a book by Ivan Van Sertima, uh, Blacks in Science, and he's actually quoted uh, one of your papers in there as well. So, well, you know. I was the uh, I used to, I was the uh, first co-editor. In fact, I was the one who told Ivan to start the magazine back in 1979. Wow. He came to Chicago, and uh, he was uh, at uh, Northeastern Illinois University. And so then, you know, a lot of them they were jealous. You know, he had a bunch of old men, and and they didn't they didn't publish anything. And so then they were jealous of Ivan Van Sertima because Ivan had published a book they came before Columbus. So mm -hmm. when I met Ivan, I said, why don't we start a magazine? So that's how I, Ivan chose the title. This, the yes. uh, What is it? The Journal of African Civilization, something like that. But anyway, so we were, we uh, I was the editor. I was the co-editor until, uh, what was it, 82, 81, 82. Because in 81, 82, he, uh, this uh, guy named uh, uh, Barry Fell. Barry Fell, Barry Fell, he was at uh, at uh, at Harvard University. And so Barry Fell told Ivan, he said, you're going to be my friend or Clyde's friend. So he went with the white <laughs> man, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so he went with the white guy, you know. But I, I was wondering for years, it was, it was Ivan, it was uh, Alexand Alexandre Van Budnau. Budnau was the one who told me, you know, because uh, Budnau had a girlfriend in Chicago with his old butt, you know, he had a girlfriend in Chicago. So when he would come to Chicago, you know, we would... Uh, you know, we would go down, he would invite me to the Art Institute, he would buy lunch and all that type of stuff. I mean, hell, he was rich, I wasn't, so. <laughs> well, you know. yes, yeah. so you've worked with some greats, you know, and of course, you know, you're great in your own right as well. Over 100 scholarly articles and also over 100 presentations, yeah. you know, that's available on your uh, Patreon. You know, I'm a proud Patreon uh, member of yours, wow. and I tell you, I, 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 there's no other Patreon that I'm that I'm signed up to the Thank post you. as often Thank as you, you do, uh, and share so much, you know, so much goodies as well. As but you we know, do. you guys, uh, my patrons, they they're very supportive. They give me a lot of good ideas. Often when I do my, uh, often when I do my live, sometimes that comes from them, you know, mm. but. Uh, but the thing is, this is that. Uh, so I, I love my patron. They're the ones who, who give me the uh, the enthusiasm to do the research. And uh, you know, a lot of times to do the research, as you know, it costs money. And then you know, yeah. you guys, my patrons, when they donate, when they donate that money, that allows me to be able to buy books. You know, I might spend two or three hundred dollars a month on books. Exactly. You know, just to yeah. keep up with this stuff because yes. a lot of times, a lot of times I do original research. And uh, and so then, uh, you know, back in the day when I back back when I was younger, that's how I got. A, I used to do a lot of book reviews. And so I would write uh, publishers and I would tell them I, was, I would uh, I would send a copy of one of my book reviews I had in various journals. Then I would say, well, send me this book and I'll write a review. I used to get a lot of books like that. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, it is. It is very expensive indeed. Uh, when you yeah. start signing up to all these different sites as well, you know, uh, because we're always wanting to try and improve the quality of our work and our production. Yeah. And yeah, it, it does cost. So to all the Patreon supporters out there, you yeah. know, that uh, support the works that we do, thank you so so much. And I know, and, and, when you, yeah, and once family, you start, uh, yeah, go ahead. And, yeah. And family, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have any favorites. I'm not that type of teacher that, that got favorites. But I am so proud of Shanice because Shanice, oh, Sister Shanice, you. she's writing articles. She's written two books. You know, God willing, she, she loves the family so much. And that's why I can't say no to her because, uh -huh. see, it's very, see, this is it. Shanice is a woman who, who who's, who's felt, that she's loved by people, you know. And see, the, the vast majority, sad to say, most Black women do not feel loved. And because they don't ever feel loved in their life, they can't share love with others. But see, Sister Janice, because I think she's she's experienced love from her family, support from her mother, her man, her daughter, you know, because of that, in a sense, she's able to share with us love. And see, 
we do not when 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 I when I use the word goddess, when I when I'm saying that I'm not I'm not using that as just some type of slang, some type of uh, some type of game or some type of rap. Is that that a, a a black woman when she feels loved, when she feels loved, she can share she can share her, herself. You know, uh, Shanice did an interview with uh, with with Reverend Shock Matthews, and she talked about all the things she did, and it blew my mind because I mean I'm I like to procrastinate sometimes. But this woman gives so much of herself, gives so much of herself. And see, I know I know it's hard on her because, see, listen, I'm a man. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a man. I'm weak. I need somebody to take care of me. And now that's what my wonderful one did. And so, so to see this woman, to see Shanice, and she's taking care of her family, she's taking care of her man, and still can share time with the family, you yeah. guys are so lucky. You're so lucky to be able to experience this, and so I just had I just had to say that I'm I'm sorry. I just got to say it. You 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 give the world love, and people, in a sense, you guys just don't understand that you're you're in the presence of a woman who loves her people because she loves herself. And she loves her family, and that's that's where it begins. It begins in the house when you love your family, you love yourself, then you can share love with the world. You see, mm -hmm. and it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard because most of us are most of us are wounded, and we're wounded because of, of all the racism and and the negativity that we experience. And so, when you can find a woman that's strong enough to say, "Damn, I I can do this. What? what? Who? I can do that." And when you find that, you have to celebrate it. And so that's why I call Shanice the Oracle. Yes, you are, and that's the, that's just the thing. She's the Oracle. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. You're such an inspiration, Dr. Clyde. You really are. I mean, I am just, you know, honoured to have met you, honoured to have done your phenomenology research programme. You've just transformed, you know, me as a, as a writer, as a researcher. You know, I'm just so fortunate uh, to have uh, met you and uh, Dr. Shot. And wow, you just continue to inspire me. And uh, we've got family members in the house. I just want to welcome everybody in the house. Welcome, welcome. Yes, Sister Afri Jamo, she's correcting us and saying, Three books, Sister Shanice, because yeah, she's she knows my very first book as well, The Coconut Trees, which was a, a oh. fiction book based on a true life events, and I wrote that. Oh, it must be about four years ago or so. So that was my very first book. So rise oh, up, Sister oh, Average Hammer. Oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We got Sister Verna, my blood sister, in the house. Welcome, welcome, V. Great to see you in the house. We got Mr. IC3 Black in the house. Woo, the family's coming through the door. We got Akil in the house. Uh, Crate Safer in the house. Uh, a definite goddess, and I'm thankful to be here with Shanice. Oh, I introduced my Jamaican dad to the channel. Thank you so, so much. Welcome, we welcome from Yard. Uh, your Jamaican dad is most welcome. The Sheraton is in the house as well. Says big up uh, to Dr. Shanice. <laughs> and blessed love in the chat. Yet uh, our, our um, Dr. Rev, Dr. Matthews, uh, he was with us last strong, as you probably know. And uh, he's bestowed a new title on me. He's given me the title of doctor. So I am humble to use my new title, Dr. Shanice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for that as well. Wow. And so since then, you know, uh, my family members in the chat, they've been reminding me, you know, Dr. Shanice, they're saying to me. <laughs> Thank you okay. so, so much. She <laughs> is the doctor. She'll cure your ills. <laughs> if you have, if you have, in a sense, Cades, Cades is culturally acquired immune deficiency. If you come here with Cades and you hate <laughs> yourself, you don't have any identity, Dr. Shamise will, will cure it because she's going to bring you with the knowledge. So, yes, she is the doctor. You know. <laughs> oh, thank you. So we're going to have a great time, a great time in the house family. And uh I just want to um, mention the topic that we were talking about earlier today on my show. I was sharing it with uh, uh, our doctor, uh, Clyde, backstage uh, mm. earlier today. Let me get my notes. 
we had a phenomenal conversation and discussion on my radio show. Uh, we were talking about the origins of us as Africans and who the first people were, the first Africans were, and what name would they have been known by? And we had, you know, a number of schools of thought and different schools of thought is absolutely fine uh, on the radio show. We like to have, you know, different perspectives because there are millions of books out there and everyone does their research and, and comes to their own different conclusion. And it's good because we as a people, we need to be writing ourselves. We need to be researching for ourselves. We need to have our own narrative and our own interpretation on things as well, because we know you know, that Wazungu is going to, you know, um, deceive us in terms of the way that they uh, communicate information to us. So we were talking about the first man and we've got uh, a segment in my show, the Marmar University segment. And, uh, you know, we was having a conversation and he was uh, uh, using uh, archaeological genetic and other documented evidence to tell us that the first Africans to emerge in Africa were the short statured people. And this short statured people migrated from out of Africa and populated the entire globe. And certainly, you know, everywhere you go, Asia, Europe, you can find, you know, um, uh, the, the short statured African sculptures and, and their artifacts, and et cetera, et cetera. So he said these were the Twa people and that these people had the greatest genetic diversity and that, you know, with the admixture of them um, with other Africans, you know, we've got taller Africans as well as short Africans. So it got really, you know, people started calling in and getting into that discussion about the Twa vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Corson people, you know, the, the, the sand people, the ones that's got the Nelson Mandela shape. Uh, type face with the slit uh, shiny eyes that talk with the click you know so we were talking about that group as well and then we had another caller come in and he said no it's not the Twa people they're not the first people uh, the first people were the people known as the Bono people and they are also known as the Akan people these were the short statured people that were um, uh, from originally from the Nile Valley region and we had another call it, caller that called in and said, look, our ancestors have told us we are from the foothills of the Nile. And uh, the foothills of the Nile, where the sun goes down, is where the foot of Kilimanjaro is. So that's where, you know, we as the first people actually come from. And Africa's the wrong way around. You know, the north is the south and the south is the north. And, you know, all of this has to be taken into consideration. Obviously, the essence of it all is that we are all Africans, but, you know, there were different groups of Africans. But what say you, Dr. Clyde? Are you going to add to the controversy here? Okay, well, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to, it's got to be, it's got to be in a sense a little bit different. I believe, I believe that the uh, first people to expand from Africa were the uh, Australian people. The reason, the reason that I, I feel that the Australians, or what we call the Aborigines, were the original Africans is because of the fact is that they still carry, remember they still carry across their bridge the uh, the uh, the sign of, of the an, an ancient man because the ancient man had a strong bridge. That's why their their faces, the kind of the uh, the bone hangs over. So the Australians were the first people who, who occupied Africa. After the Australians migrated out of Africa, because see the Australians began to migrate out, migrate out of Africa between one hundred and thirty thousand and 100,000 BC. Then after the Australians, after the Australians uh, left Africa, because see, what, what you do is that you look at the archeological evidence. What I mean by the archeological evidence is that you look, at, you look at the human remains that they found in South Africa, because South Africa has the best, the best, you know, the best in a sense, you know, archeological evidence for the various existences of different African groups of people. Because see, sometimes we want to imagine that African people are a monolithic population. No, we're not. We're not a monolithic population. Okay, then after, in a sense, after 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 uh, the uh, the Australians, because it, it seems as though the Australians they mainly walked to Australia or they came to the Americas. They didn't go into Europe because at that time Europe was full of uh, Neanderthal people, and uh, we're not going to go into that question because that that's complicated and and uh, many people. Have been uh, brainwashed. After uh, after Neanderthal, after the uh, 
after the Australians, then the first the first black people to go into Europe are the Khoisan. The Khoisan are the sand people. They live in South Africa today. The reason, in a sense, that I say the Khoisan is that we see that the Khoisan they they introduced into Europe the Salutrian and and the earlier the earlier uh, stone tools. The reason we can say this is that the original the original area where the tools were found was in South Africa. Many people say, Dr. Winters, we don't go off that carbon dating. True, I mean, it's as difficult as with carbon dating, all type of datings. But most of the uh, most of the uh, dating that that related to the periods in South Africa is based upon the uh, stratigraphy stratigraphy of the soil. You know, they the different levels of the soil they can go down the ages. So the Khoisan the Khoisan entered Europe around forty four thousand BC. When the Khoisan came into Europe, they absorbed, they absorbed in the sense of Neanderthal man. You got to remember in the sense of that. Where do these people go, except for the Tasmanians and a few other groups that were exterminated by uh, by by non non African people? Most of the people are just absor absorbed. Then we find in a sense that that the Khoisan, they were the major population in Europe and even in the Americas between forty four thousand BC and around 10,000 BC, around 10,000 BC, then we see the expansion of the Twa or the Anu people. In fact, the Anu people, they are, they are geniuses. In Europe, in Europe, when they, in Europe, when they talk about the Anu people, the Anu people, they represent what you've heard about the leprechauns, the wee people, the little people. If you capture them, you can get a pot of gold. The Anu, the Anu are cowards. They're some cowards, but they're very brainy. And in fact, Many of you may not know this, but many of the so-called people we call grays, so-called the uh, the so-called aliens, they're not grays. That gray is just their suit. The big eyes is just the the eyes of the suit. Up under that up under that suit, you'll find the Anu or the Twa people, blue black people, you know. But see, they they don't want to tell you this in the past. The original findings were these little black people who flew the flying saucers. You see. But again, as I said, they're kind of cowardly. So they don't like, they don't want any trouble. They built a magnificent civilization to this, even up to today. I'm really trying to, I'm really trying to recover the civilization of the Anu people that they had. They built, they built roads of stone. They were able to move, you know, gigantic pieces of stone. Like they were able to move gigantic pieces of stone. They were able to move them and put them in place. They built, they built the Sphinx, they built the pyramids. They over and over and over here in America. America used to have stone pyramids, but uh, but Europeans they they tore the pyramids down and used them to build buildings and houses. But it used to be it used to even be stone pyramids over here. They made stone walls over here. The Yanu mm -hmm. people and these walls these walls had had stones that were that were 12, 12 and fifteen feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and and, and yay long, just super long. So the Yanu. I've been trying to recover that civilization, but much of that civilization now was a, much of it was destroyed during the Younger Dryas. That was when they had the uh, the, the Younger Dryas around ten thousand, but their civilization lasted until around four thousand BC. That was when it was the last the uh, the last cataclysms that impacted on the earth. And the Anu people, again, as I said, most of them were driven into the center of the earth by Europeans, because as the Europeans came into Europe. They used to call. They used to, in a sense, capture the wee people, and then, in a sense, they would want to get stuff from them. So the uh, the Anu, the the most of the uh, the advanced Anu, they live in the center of the earth now. The Anu that we find now is this: is that if you notice, they when the Europeans expanded, they found Twa people on every continent. Every continent they found Twa people, mainly in the hills and in the jungles, because see, uh, that's where they uh, that's where they fled to. Okay. At the 4,000, around 4,000 BC, there's a so-called great flood that we hear about from the Bible. This kind of wiped out many Anu sites. That's one of the reasons why the Anu, you found them in China, up in the mountains, you found them in Brazil, everywhere. And so when this flood came, what happened is that that destroyed, that destroyed in a sense, the metals trade. And so then around, uh, around 3,500, around 3,500 BC, then the taller black people, you see, we uh, came on the scene. You can call them Bantu or whatever. We came on the scene, and then we conquered the Anu in Egypt. 
We conquered the Anu in Mesopotamia. This was uh, Nimrod. You know, we call him uh, Namor. Namor really is he, it was really Nimrod. So after he, in a sense, conquered these areas, and if you notice the uh, palette of minis, you notice the palace of minis. You'll notice, in a sense, that he's real tall, and then it's little short people. We know, in a sense, from the research of uh, of, of Antiochus, Antiochus is that the Anu people were the founders of civilization in Egypt, you see. Mm -hmm. And so then I've been really trying to recover this civilization, but it's it's kind of hard because a lot of that stuff is underwater, a lot of it was destroyed, so it's very difficult. But that's how I see it. So first, the Australians, Aborigines, after that, the Khoisan. And the interesting thing about the Khoisan is that the Khoisan, they carry just about every gene. They carry all. They carry just about every gene that people carry today. That's one of the reasons why the Europeans they acknowledge that the Khoisan were their ancestors. You know, then after the Khoisan, we have the Twa or the Anu people. Then after the Anu people, we had the Bantu or the taller black people. You see, for example, a lot of people they get it mixed up. When when they see people in Ethiopia, they talk about the Ethiopians have, in a sense, white features. No, the Ethiopians do not have white features. White people have have black features that the Ethiopians bequeathed to them. See, they've got those features came from us. You see, just like uh, the Dravidians, in a sense, they came from us. Because see, many people don't know there was a period when the, when uh, when when the North Pole. There was a period when the North Pole was in the Atlas Mountains, and it was during that period that those black people that lived near near the uh, North Pole. That's when they that's when they started having straight hair. And because you have straight hair, because the straight hair, in a sense, it 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 holds heat in, whereas whereas kinky hair, it uh it uh it in a sense it releases releases uh hair. Like like I'm gonna ask you a question, uh, you know, Shanice, yeah. When you went to Gabon, was were were you a little surprised seeing those women with with beautiful hair, soft, luxurious hair? Were you surprised by that? Gabon. I've not yeah. been to Gabon. I mean, uh, 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 Gambia. 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 Yeah. Um, there are mostly they've got tight, uh, coiled hair. Uh, yeah, most of them have got got you know Bantu uh, type hair yeah. in in the Gambia. Got all these oils and stuff in Greece, especially over here in the Americas, and that's what made their hair look much more straighter than than, yeah. than we would normally see it. But that's how yeah. I see it. But again, it's very important to remember, family, is that is that I'm a researcher. Mm -hmm. And because of the fact that I'm a researcher, I can have my opinion about things, but my opinion is no better than anybody else's opinion unless you can have, you know, support. The more the more articles and, and, and research that support your theory may give your theory some type of uh, some type of validity. But it's very important to understand that in research, we never say anything is proven. We mm. say confirm or disconfirm. Because as new knowledge is developed, then things can change. Because mm. see, back when I was younger, back when I was younger, I thought that the Twa were the original people. You know, mm. but then as I did more and more research and I started studying people worldwide, then I started seeing that, oh, nah, you know. Mm. So, uh, but again, it's, there's nothing wrong with having a different opinion. I, yeah, I, no, it's it's good. It, it adds to you know the the fact that we are such a diverse people. You know, right. and we have been around possibly you know millions of years as a people. Uh, who knows how long we've been here for? The works of Michael Cremio, I mean, suggest that you know uh, the mainstream are actually collapsing time, and they are hiding the fact you know that we are much older than we than we really are as a people. But um, some phenomenal works that our people have done the globe over. So you've just added to the controversy there based on the conversations that we were having uh, earlier today. Uh, and it just goes to show, as you said, there's so much yet to be uncovered and more and new information is being uncovered on a daily basis. I mean, today we've got the works of geneticists. Uh, their work wasn't really uh, so readily available uh, you know, a couple of decades ago, and uh, their work is is bringing a lot of new information as well uh, about our history. But there's certain, you know, histories of ours that just cannot be disputed. The fact that, you know, carved into those rocks, 
you know, the images of us as, a, as Africans all over the world, you know, because we've obviously always been a spiritual people. And so, you know, we would carve our images into rocks and caves and have these places as as a ceremonial spaces, sacred spaces where, you know, we'd worship. And, and so, you know, fortunately, those exceptionally talented Asian Africans who had so much skills with the uh, with uh, stonemasonry work have just left us a phenomenal legacy a phenomenal legacy about our greatness but yes so much more to uncover as you say well thank you so much for sharing all of that uh, knowledge with us you've given us more work now to go away and do you've added uh, to uh, you know the the discussion and uh, you've come with a different perspective but we love it Thank you so much. Let's go over to the chat. Let's see uh, if we've got any comments uh, from the family in the chat. Welcome, welcome, everybody. As you can see, we've got our phenomenal guest in the house, Dr. Clyde Winters. And uh, we're already having a really interesting and enlightening conversation. And uh, please do give us a thumbs up. Thanks, Sister Afri Jamo. Yeah, please do give us a, th a thumbs up. Rise up, rise up, uh, Brother Kwame Obodje in the house. Good to have you in the house. Paulo Cornelius is saying that he's really enjoying the information. It is so interesting. Oh, that is great. Yes, Sister Afrijamo, uh, where Dr. Mumbi is from, from the fit foothills of Kilimanjaro. Absolutely. Zachary, welcome all the way from Chicago, Illinois. B1, Black First, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, welcome, welcome, family. Uh, welcome, uh, Brother Kwame Oboje. Uh, Shay, he says, peace to these Africans rule the world as well as uh, investing and building uh, as we went. Uh, truly inspirational indeed. So welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, we've got a great show lined up for you today. And uh, we have a powerhouse uh, in the uh, in the hot seat today, who's going to be uh, taking us on a steep but really interesting and exciting learning curve. Wow! So. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for joining us on the Sister Shanice Show. This is a show that's going to be bringing you African history, knowledge, uh, Pan-African consciousness. <laughs> We're bringing it to you live and direct for your soul, your body. You know, we want to inspire. We want to uplift each and every one of you. And I know Dr. Clyde is going to be doing that. Big time, yes, you are. Uh, big time for each of us. He's a historian and a linguist, an archaeologist, uh, an educator, and so much more, an author. And uh, he is forever uncovering new information and bringing that information to our attention as a people. He has over 50 years experience in doing the research family and you know he is truly truly a treasure a living legend during our time and we are so honored to have him in the house today and uh, Dr. Clyde we thank you so so much for being the phenomenal powerhouse that you are and so I'm going to turn over the hot seat to you uh, for our session today looking forward to it because and those of you who've got family from the Caribbean yeah you're gonna be in for a treat today because we're homing in on the Muslims uh, in the Caribbean world. Dr. Can, I, Clark, can, I, can I share the screen? Yes you can yes yes yeah, so we've got a great session today. We, uh, we're looking at the Taina people, uh, some of the original people from uh, that part of the world, the part of the world that we call the West Indies. Okay, so we've got uh, all your slides on the screen at the moment. Okay. So, here we go. Uh, If they run in their mouth, then they looking for trouble. Ran right up in the knowledge. Now they packing a the hub. Now they know we can fight. Content giving every week. Uh, me and Dr. Rip shot. Uh, keep on bringing the heat. Uh, 
Now they know that we hitting, and they know we ain't quitting. Yo, she mind the jiggin', keep on bringing and giving. Unity, 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 cause they know we ain't stopping. And they know they got problems, and they ran out of options. This we know we got a problem, can't let it go unsolved. Brain uh, brains learning, Afrocentric history, we seen them all. Uh, karma is karma, I say what I say, I hear the wall. Uh, Till I see y'all fall off, then I bring y'all up on all my back up on my client winners. I have not cursed, I have not been violent, I have not confounded truth, I have not been emotional, I have not cursed the God. has illustrated that Africans have been settling the new world and building new civilizations and cultures in the Americas and around the world for the past 100,000 years. Dr. Winters has published and written numerous anthropological, linguistics, education, and population genetics articles. Many of these articles have appeared in peer-reviewed journals and online. His work has appeared in the Journal of Black Studies, Africa Historique, Journal of African Civilization, Adolescence, International Review of Education, Thresholds in Education, TC Record, Bioessays, International Journal of Human Genetics, and PLOS Genetics, to name a few. He has published over 40 books including Atlantis in Mexico, The Monde in the Ancient Americas, We Are Not Just Africans, and African Empires in Ancient America. For more of Dr. Clyde Winters, check out Yoshimad Gumroad page and that will lead you to the master himself, Dr. Clyde Winters. Yeah, uh, that was uh, done by Yoshimad. This is a great this is a great artist, a great producer. He does music. If you guys want to bring, you know, if you really want to take your uh, business to the next level, your website to the next level, check out the genius, Yoshimad. Who are the career Ventano? Go to my Patreon. The slides that I'm going to show today, you'll be able to find these uh, slides in my Patreon. My patrons are very important to me. I love them very much. And I love them not just because of the fact that they provide me with, 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 the support to be able to buy books, buy articles. I mean, if you look online, a lot of those articles, if you want to just read an articles that are under a, under a, you know, under a, under an, uh, I forgot what they call it, but if you want to read these articles, sometimes you got to pay as much as $100 or at least 
$25 just to read them for maybe a day or so. So I really, in a sense, do a lot of research. This research costs money. And thank you, Patreon. I love my Patreon out there. And if you want to help me to be able, in a sense, to do the research that I do, to bring the knowledge to you, family, please join my Patreon. Also join uh, Sister Shanice's Patreon because she she uh, needs the support too. But join my Patreon and my slides, the slides of this presentation, and every presentation I do know where, no matter where I'm at, and I do a lot of shows all over the place, you're going to find all of my presentations, the slides, are, in my, are on my Patreon. You can find me at Twitter, at Dr. Clyde Winners 8. Uh, my Twitter, um, I'm not too much on Twitter, but lately I've been uh, posting a lot of uh, video shorts dealing with various aspects of, uh, of, of Black and African history. So, uh, you know, uh, check out uh, my, uh, check me out on Twitter at, at Clyde Winners 8, Dr. Clyde Winners 8. Uh, you can find my uh, videos at uh, YouTube. I have over 200 videos on every aspect of, of Black and African history. Please go to, go to my YouTube page, subscribe. Subscribe to right now, right now. Right now, I want everybody that's in that's in the in the uh, on the program, press the subscribe button for Sister Shanice. Press that subscribe button, and now go to the uh, go to the next button and uh, press the button that says that you like this video, because see, you're going to get stuff that you've never heard before, because that's what Sister Shanice does. She brings it to you. But go to my uh, go to my uh, YouTube page. And subscribe there because I do a lot of uh at least once a month I do a live. And uh if you if you subscribe, then usually you'll get a message. Okay, you can order my books on Amazon.com. Uh some of my books that deal with ancient America include Atlantis and Mexico. That book is about uh the Omex. African Empires in Ancient America. That book tells you about all of the various empires, yes, you know, Ivan and uh and Renoko Rashidi. They talk about the African contribution to American civilization. That's fine. But what I do in my book, African Empires in Ancient America, is that I show that there were actual empires. Yes, empires. This was a black continent like Europe, Africa, everywhere. The Americas was a black continent. Get my book, African Empires in Ancient America, if you're interested. Now, if you want to know about uh, the uh, the Aboriginal black people in America, in the North America, get my book, We're Not Just Africans. In my book, We're Not Just Africans, I provide a history of the relationship between, you know, foundation, Aboriginal foundational Black Americans and Africans who came to, came to the Americas as uh, enslaved people. Uh, if you want to find out about the various writing systems in South America, get my books, Ancient Scripts in South America. And this book, is this is the only book that exists that really shows, in a sense, that the people in South America, in South America, many of them black, were in a sense highly literate. Then you can get my book, The Mandian Ancient Americas. I talk about the uh, various Mandingo tribes, not all of them, because I found about three or four, since I published the book, I found about three or four different Mandingo tribes that were in just Virginia alone. But, but uh, you know, I've already published a book, so I can't add that now. Uh, and then finally, if you want to find out about the mound builders of America, get my book, The Black Mound Builders of America. What makes this book unique is that in this book, I show that many of the mounds they found in many of the mounds over here along the Mississippi River, many of those mounds have the same artifacts. Yes, many of these mounds have the same artifacts that you find in mounds that were built along the Niger Valley. So get want to get these books and they can give you an outstanding, an outstanding, in a sense, understanding of the history of Blacks in ancient America. Foundational Black Britons is not a group. Foundational Black Britons is not an organization. Foundational Black Britons is a lineage. A lineage is lineal descent from an ancestor, ancestry or pedigree. As a result, foundational Black Britons are descendants of the Carib, Black Irish, and Africans who built the United Kingdom and the island nations of the Caribbean. Yes, yes. Just because you just because you've returned, you've returned from the Caribbean, maybe to London, 
somewhere in the United Kingdom, Scotland, Ireland, you're at home. That's where your ancestors came from. They took your ancestors from Scotland, from mm -hmm. Britain, from mm -hmm. Ireland, mm -hmm. and they deposit them in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. When you go back to Britain, you're not an interloper. You're not an immigrant. You're just coming home, foundational yes. Black Britons. We are, we are constantly told that the Blacks that existed in the Americas were enslaved. But this is false. Europeans have known about Blacks in America for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Yes, yes. These were some of the people that, that, that the Spanish met. Look at those robes. Look at that gold. Look at that distinctiveness. And yet, and yet, they would teach you that there were no Black people in the Caribbean, in Central America, or in South America. But here's the evidence it was. But they skirt over this evidence because we're taught a history of lies. This begs the question, when and how did Black people come to the Americas? It appears that Africans have been coming to America for over 100,000 years. Yes, 100,000 years. But vast numbers of Africans came to the Americas, it appears, with Abu Bakari between 1310 and 1313 AD. Many Africans came to America with Abu Bakari, the Mansa of um, the ancient empire of Mali. These Malians had a great influence in the Americas and according to the number of, of, of canoes, and some of these canoes were, were, they were, they were made out of trees and some of these trees were gigantic. And that when you really think about the number of canoes that uh, Mansa, Abu Bakari, took the sail from America, sail from the Mali Empire to what, what the Europeans call the New World, they would total over 25,000. 25,000 people came with Abu Bakari. That's not, that's not even talking about the exploratory group. And you're saying to yourself, what about these numbers? But that's just it, you see. You've been taught lies about our history. You've been taught in the sense that We've always been land lovers, that African people have never had any interest in finding out about any other part of the world. You've been taught that African people didn't know how to build ships. You've been taught that African people didn't know how to make maps. You've been taught in the sense that everything that ever happened in the world came from Europeans. That's a lie. That's a lie. Europeans learned about America from their travels along the west coast of Africa. Vasco da Gama is said to have found out information concerning the West Indies from Ahmed V. Majid of West Africa. In AD 1312, Emperor Abu Bakari of Mali gave his throne to Mansa Musa and embarked with his fleet into the Atlantic Ocean in search of the continent opposite Africa. Archaeologists and epigraphic evidence indicates that Abu Bakari and or members of the expedition settled in pre-Columbian Brazil. You know, when you look at this map, this map, this map makes it appear that Africa is very distant. But do you know, do you know that it's only a thousand, a thousand miles between Brazil and West Africa? A thousand miles. I mean, some of us, I, I don't know about you guys in the UK, but uh you know, I, I have a family down south, so some of us drive a thousand miles just to go visit our family that lives down in Georgia and Florida. I live in Chicago. So a thousand miles is nothing, see? And and so Mansa Abu Bakari, what he did is that he wanted to, in a sense, find out about what was on the other side of the world. And the way, reason that he knew it was something over there is because, in fact, he had talked to the Moors that lived in Spain, the Moors that lived in Portugal because these Moors had made maps. They were trading up and down the coast of the Americas, all the way from Mexico, all the way up to Canada. Yes. Even Fadullah al Umari, in his, in his encyclopedia, Masjidik al-Aqsar, said the mariners from Mali during the reign of Abu Bakari 
made transatlantic voyages. El Umari obtained his information from Mansa Musa, who was handed the kingship of Mali by King or Mansa Abu Bakari when he set out to colonize the Americas. I know all of you have heard probably about the great Mansa Musa of Mali, and that Mansa Musa of Mali is considered to be the richest man in the history of the world. And we know that he brought so much gold with him on his way to Hajj, to make the Hajj to Mecca, that he made, in a sense, the value of gold in Egypt go down. And that's just to show you his richness. And, and just think about it, if Mansa Musa, if Mansa Musa could, could cause that type of situation and the richness of the Mali Empire at that time, just think about Abu Bakari, who was leaving the Mali Empire to sail to the New World. And he brought along with him 25,000 people. 25,000. The Malian people introduced their military, agricultural, and boat technology to the Americas. The Mandine built dwellings depending on the topography. Around AD 1310, thousands of Mandine speakers arrived in the Americas from ancient Mali. Ibn Fadul Umari and his encyclopedia Mazalink Absar lets us know how they colonized the New World. Ibn al Umar wrote, and I quote, but the emperor, Abu Bakari, did not believe him, continued Musa, Mansa Musa. I quote, he equipped 2,000 vessels, 1,000 for himself and 1,000 for water and supplies. He conferred power on me, Mansa Musa, and left with his companions on the ocean. The, unquote. The expeditionary force of Mansa Abu Bakari must have been immense because the average boat on the Niger in the 1500s AD could carry 80 men. Yes, 80 people on these boats. This means that anywhere between 25,000 to 80,000 men may have sailed from Mali along with Mansa Abu Bakari. West African nautical science suggests that many members of Abu Bakari expeditionary force made it to America because we find many Mandi Mali inscriptions throughout Mesoamerica, North America, and South America. Yes, these, uh, these explorers, they left inscriptions. They tell us much about the civilization. It tells us also information about where they lived and how they, in a sense, supported themselves in their colonies once they arrived in the Americas. The Malians spoke many languages, including Nakan, Dogon, Bozo, Mandi, Maninkan, etc. There were Malian tribes settled throughout Brazil, Mexico and the United States of America. They left many inscriptions in the southwestern part of the United States. The presence of Manding in four corners is supported by the appearance of Dogon and Bambara ideograms called petroglyphs on rocks in the Anasazi area. Moreover, there are several tablets found in four corners and the Brazil statuette, which have been deciphered, that were written in an aspect of the Mandi or Malinke Bambara language. When, when Columbus came to the so-called New World, he met the Carib people. Here's some pictures that, uh, that uh, Agonasto, uh, an, uh, an Italian painter, these are some uh, paintings that he did of the uh, Carib people, the people that the British interacted with and who the Spanish also knew. When Columbus came to the so-called New World, he met the Carib people. Because the Carib were black like the South Indians, he imagined that he was an Indian. These Carib people were the first inhabitants of the Caribbean islands. The British took away from the Spanish. Here we can see uh, some pictures of, uh, of a Carib, of Carib women. And uh, these, uh, these, these art pieces were done by Augustino Brunius, circa 1780. So we can see that as late as the 1700s, it was still Caribs, you know. But they tell you that uh, when, when people in Jamaica, when people in Jamaica, when they say in a sense that they have Taino or Carib heritage, they say, you're a liar. They all disappear. No. As you can see, as late as 1780, we they still have, in a sense, their own tribal affairs. And uh, as you can see also, they uh, carried their, their children. Like I know you've heard about the papooses over here. Well, they carried their children and even in Africa. Back in the day, many women carried their uh, children on their back. 
But here you can see uh, two Caribbean women. The Spanish called the Native Americans Indians because they were black like the South Indians. I had a brother once, he said, uh, Dr. Winters, uh, stop that, stop that. They didn't know nothing about India. Yes, yes. They knew about India. Europeans knew about India ever since Greco-Roman times. <clears throat> yes, Greco-Roman times, you see? And they, because they were trading with India, and they knew, and they called them Indian because the people that they traded with lived in South Africa, um, South India. And South India is predominantly occupied with, by people who speak a, a a series of related languages that we call Dr Dravidian languages. And because they were black, the Dravidians were black. So when they met, when they met these, uh, when they came to the Carib, they said, hey, these are black people too. So they must be Indians. And this is a picture of uh, Chateauyard, the chief of the, uh, of the Caribs on St. Vincent with his wives. I want to, I want to. <laughs> they have found many black skeletons of these Indians in the Caribbean. Here's an article from Man. In this article, the monthly record of anthropological science, it was published in April 1939. The recent paper in this journal by Boxton, Trevor, and Julian implies that an, that an undeformed Negroid physical type inhabited the Virgin Islands in pre-Columbian time. Not only in this implication contrary to previously accepted findings, for the Antillean area as well. So again, they've even found skeletons and now they found even more skeletons, but they try to keep this undercover because see, they want they want people in the Caribbean believe that, to believe that, oh, it was no people in the Caribbean. No black people were in the Caribbean. No, stop it. Uh, but they want to teach you there were no black people in the Caribbean until what? Until in a sense they brought Africans from the African continent. But as you can see from those Carib people, I mean, hey, you couldn't tell any difference between a Carib or an African because they all had Negroid features. But this is something they don't tell you about. The first settlers arrived on the island of Jamaica between 4,000 and 1,000 BC, venturing across the sea from South America. They were a part of the Arawak tribes known as Tainos and lived in villages ruled by a single chief, either male or female, and a medicine man. You see, just like just like we call Sister Shanice the doctor. Yes, she's the doctor. She has the medicine. She has the medicine to relieve you of CAIDS. CAIDS is culturally acquired immune deficiency syndrome. When you catch CAIDS, you lose your identity and you begin, in a sense, to feel inferior to Europeans. And due to this inferiority, you have headaches, you have illness, you have sickness. And that's why you're here today. You're here today to get some medicine from Dr. Shanice, some medicine to reinvigorate you and let you know that you're not alone. And that as Black African people, you do have a history. Okay. Fry Inigo says that the Indians of Puerto Rico were copper colored, short in stature, well proportioned, with flat noses and wide nostrils, long, thick, black, coarse hair. Shalivarsi says their nostrils open. Francisco the Amaro wrote, the nostrils are wide open. In war, men painted their bodies red with a vegetable dye called Bia. You know, you know uh, when you look at this picture on the, on the right-hand side, I've, I've always been fascinated by the simple fact that, uh, that, that, that the uh, Aboriginal uh, Black people in the Caribbean, the Aboriginal Black people in the uh, in uh in in the south, the, the south of the United States, they always had they always used to like to wear red bandanas, and we know the Dave and the Moors like to wear uh like to wear red fe uh, fezes. I, I wish I could find something that could explain to me why they liked red, but it has to be some uh some reason for that. But I, I'll admit when I was growing up, you know, whenever you went out, you know, a sister when you know uh. Uh, you had a good time because the sister had to put a red dress, baby. <laughs> that we had on your head. Yes, sir. So, so it's something about that red. Yeah. This is a glimpse back into the world of the Tainos in the island of Jamaica. Jamaica, Oyamai, Oyamayeka. Those are some of the names that they had for Jamaica. You know, land of wood. It means the land of woods and waters. The Tainos were dark-skinned people just like these people. 
The Mandin, Mayo, Tommy, and Dano, a language formerly spoken in the Caribbean, share pronouns. For example, in Mande, we have na, in Dano, we have me, me and Otomi, we have nga, maya, in. So as you can see, the Otomi, the Taino, and the Mandin, they share, in a sense, these, these pronouns. I know a lot of you guys, over the years, you've heard them say that the Spanish, the Spanish were able to bring uh, Moors with them, and these Moors were interpreters. And they were able to talk to the Indians, you see. Many people say, well, how could the Moors, how could these uh, Moors be interpreters? How could they speak to these Aboriginal people? Well, I want to explain to you the reason that they could speak to these Aboriginal people, because the Moors spoke Arabic. And see, Arabic has a basic set of what's called root words. And, and all of the, every Semitic language shares these root, root words. And because of the fact that we know that many of the uh, many of the uh, the Mandingo people had came with with Mansa Musa, if not earlier, then we know in a sense that that was one of the reasons that the Moors could translate the Aboriginals' languages to the uh, Spanish. Because see, black people, anybody that's been around black people in Africa, you'll find in a sense that that many and often when people live near the border. You find people that live near the border that can speak maybe two or three different African languages, and often they have what's called a lingua franca. And this lingua franca is made up of words from all the various languages in the area, and they're able to use this lingua franca to communicate with each other. And you find in a sense that that's what was happening in the Americas. Because of the fact that you had Moors coming from Portugal, Spain, and trading tobacco all the way from Mexico all the way up to uh, Canada, even before the Europeans got here. That's why when they brought their Moorish, their Moorish translators, the Moors were able to talk to the uh, local people because there was at least maybe two, three or more people in every village that spoke that spoke a Semitic language, may it be Arabic or Hebrew. And the reason they spoke these languages is because of the fact that they were trading with these Moors even before the Europeans got here. So that's why the Moors were able to bring these, I mean, that's why the Spanish were able to bring these Moors, and these Moors served as interpreters between the Spanish and the Aboriginal people. You know, Mandy is a substratum, the substratum language of Taino. It's improbable to suggest that borrowing coincidence can account for the phenomenal agreement between Mandy, Maya, Taino, and Otomi for two reasons. One, the accepted historical date for the meeting of the speakers of these languages is far too late to account for the grammatical affinities and corresponding terms found within these languages. And two, borrowing is very rare from a culturally subordinate, from a culturally a subordinate linguistic group, the African slaves, into a culturally dominant linguistic group, the Amerindians, Indians, particularly in the basic vocabulary areas. This hypothesis is also supported by the fact that the Taino words were collected before Mandy speaking slaves were taken to the Americas. Yes, yes, yes. For example, you know, you find in a sense that, that these people were using Mandy words even before they even started the slave trade, <clears throat> you know, and people, the Atlantic slave trade. So this shows an earlier presence of Mandy people, probably because of the, uh, the travels of Abu Bakari in the Americas when the Spanish got here. The Taino were farmers, fishermen, hunters, and gatherers. They nourished themselves with the food provided by the land and sea. Their main edible foods were cassava, yuca, potato, batata, and yam. These were also the staple crops of Taino farmers. The cassava was used for a variety of purposes, including bami. Tobacco, another staple, was used socially and ritualistically. The most basic Taino meal was pepper, pepper, pepper pot. Multiple families lived in round houses called bohils, bohils, but the chief's house was usually rectangular. The people slept in hammocks and traveled by canoe. In fact, the words hammock and canoe are derived from the Taino languages, as are hurricane, hurricane tobacco, and barbecue. These all came from the uh, Taino language. In Jamaica, the Tainos established an estimated 200 villages by the time Christopher Columbus set foot on the island in 1494 and numbered around 60,000 people. Yes, 60,000 people. They thrived for thousands of years by cultivating corn, 
gathering local fruits and catching fish and turtles for food. Tainos had a number of gods. Adabera or Adabe was the mother of all waters and the mother, the great one. And Guabansex, lady of the winds, mistress of the hurricanes. A major male god was Yukahu, the spirit of Yuka or Kasava. Men and women played specific roles in society. For example, the men engaged in hunting and fishing, and the women kept house and weaved cotton into cloth. The people visited and traded with other islands by canoes, canoas, made from silk cotton trees, siebas. The word canoe agrees with the Mandy word for boat, and the Mandy word for boat is kula or kuna. So when you have canoas, that's almost, that relates to kunas, kunas, canoas. So we can see how, how they even used, in a sense, a Mandy word for their most common boat, which was the canoe. The Taino people were phenotypically Negro or African. As a result, they were not all killed off. They were just integrated into Jamaican society. Many of them were probably mar maroons. Yes, yes, yes. The plains and coastlines of South Manchester and St. Elizabeth are known to be places where Taino had lived. Artifacts, rock carvings, and paintings have been found in the region. Southfield, Blunthers, Flag, Flagerman, Pedro Cross, Pedro Plain, Jun Juncture, Bull Sabana, Ballard's Valley, and Treasure Beach are some of the districts in the region. And recently, the Glenner was brought to a spot near Bull Savanna, where there are several pieces of clay pipes and utensils. Yeah, so with these beautiful Jamaica, beautiful Taino women, just like today. Dr. Niga, Niga Na, Nagwed Nadwagon, who identifies herself as 100% Taino and African, was brought up in the Pedro Plain Treasure Beach area and attended half the school, where a teacher once told a class that the Tainos were all dead. And there she was in the class. She said she had always known that she is Taino because of her features, family stories, and blood memories. Yes, yes. They tell you that the Tainos disappear, but they're telling you that in Jamaica, Puerto Rico, other places around the Caribbean, they're telling you that all the people died out. Because of the fact they do not want you to identify with the land. They want you to feel that you're strangers, immigrants on the land, that everybody in Jamaica came from Africa. When the people of Jamaica, some were Taino, many were Black Irish, and Sister Janice went over this about the past couple of, uh, about last month, she went over this with you guys. Know your history. But it is also to, to remember that Blacks in the Caribbean were not only slaves, you hear some uh, free Black women. Look at these stylish sisters with their head wraps, they're wearing their hats, looking all boss, looking all cool. Yes, 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 yes. Stop allowing Europeans to fill your mind with negative things, fill your mind with lies. In conclusion, here we can see some Tainos in their local uh, village. In conclusion, the Caribbean for thousands of years. We've also learned that the Taino and Carib were not exterminated by the British. They were absorbed by the other Blacks who lived on these islands. Dr. Niganagwedgen observed that, and I quote, Tainos are alive and well throughout Jamaica, just that many people do not know. The government knows that we exist, and I know that the government knows that there are Taino people in St. Elizabeth. After today's talk, you also know that the Carib and Taino exist. In fact, many of you in Jamaica, and many of you from Jamaica, are carrying that Carib and that Taino ancestry. Here's some references. Here's some different articles and books about the Taino. These references, you can find them if you go draw my Patreon, get the slides, and these can give you some sources. They can tell you where to find out more about the Taino 
and the Korean people. Again, go to my Patreon to see the slides. The slides are going to be in my Patreon. You can go to Twitter at Dr. Clyde Winners 8. As I said, I've been doing a lot of short videos on, on uh, Black history. You can go to Clyde Winners YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel. Please subscribe. I'd like to get it up to uh, 25,000. Please uh, help me. Subscribe. Push that like button right now. Push the like button right now. Take your finger up. Press subscribe to Sister Denise's channel. And now, press down the I like this video button. If you didn't like it, well, I'm sorry. And you hurt my feelings. You can order my books at Amazon.com. Sister Denise, I know she's got this book next to, her, next to her, but she's written a remarkable book. And this book is called The Remarkable Accomplishments of Ancient African Civilization. This book is beautiful. I don't know who the artist was that she used to illustrate this book, but this book is beautiful. Your children, if you can get your children a copy of this book, it's an easy way for them to learn about African civilization. It has these beautiful pictures and illustrations that will just get your, that will make your children look at these pictures and see themselves. Yes, see themselves in history. Our people, our children need to know their history. Our people. Our children need to know where we came from, many of us. <laughs> and Sister Janice has done this. Get this book, The, Remar the Remarkable Accomplishments of Ancient African Civilization. You can find it at Amazon.com. Okay, as I told you before, Yoshi, Yoshi, Yoshi Ma did, my, uh, did that introduction. Yoshi Ma can take your website take your videos to the next level. Let's look and see what he offers you in terms of services. At Yoshimod Productions, we're here to take your brand and creativity to new heights. From EPKs to AI commercials, animated music commercials to animated AI bios, book covers to picture flyers, and so much more, we've got you covered. Our team is dedicated to delivering high quality, cutting edge designs that leave a lasting impression. And for our valued clients, we offer exceptional creativity, a customer centric approach, and work that reflects the latest trends and technologies. Just about making art, we're about creating experiences. Your brand, your vision, our artistry. Professionalism and reliability are the cornerstones of everything we do. We're more than a service, we're your creative partners. If you're ready to make your brand shine, look no further than Yoshimod Productions. Join us in the journey of creativity. Contact us today and let's make your vision a reality. Yeah, check out our Yoshimod Productions. He has reasonable uh, prices. I'm, I guarantee you, you will be satisfied with his work because the man is a genius. Okay, check at out Yoshimod my books at uh, Amazon.com. The books include Atlantis and Mexico, African Empires. We are not just Africans. South... Um, Ancient uh, scripts in South America, the Mandian ancient Americas, the Black Mound Builders of the Americas. Get one of these books. Get Go to Amazon.com. Just put in Clyde Winter's books, and they will show you all of my books. And I'm sure that you will find a book that you will enjoy, a book that you will like. B1, Black First, baby. Black First. B1. Thank you. Well, we thank you, Dr. Clyde Winters. Thank you so, so much. Another very informative and educational presentation by Dr. Clyde Winters. And uh, you can get hold of a copy of that presentation uh, on his Patreon site. So join up, become a Patreon supporter of the works and get yourself a copy of that presentation so that you can review it 
and uh, bring the knowledge and education and information to your children as well, because we've got to pass the knowledge on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Wow. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal bit of history. And uh, it reads like a wonderful storybook, but it's not. It's our history. I mean, the story of uh, Abu Bakr, uh, what, what's his name? Emperor Abu Bakari and his voyage. You know, that is a film in its own right, isn't it? Taking about 25,000 men on these huge ships. Women too. Into the Women unknown. Too. We were explorers. Our people were so brave. Oh, my gosh, it's it's a phenomenal story in its own right. And then, of course, he left Mansa Musa behind to run the empire. Another phenomenal story there in terms of him being, you know, the richest man in the world. And I mean, you were talking about the women who were weaving um, silk into right. cotton. And, you know, so we were weaving cloths and making wonderful materials. And then they want to portray us as people who walked around naked. Yeah, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, uh, the other day, the other day, uh, we were uh, we were having class in my class, and we were talking about uh, we were talking about, you know, uh, we had a debate. One group of one group of my uh, students, they said that uh, that that men want polygamy because of uh, polygamy because of uh, they've been uh, they they have a lot of trauma. That's why they want to have maybe two or three wives, and then uh, and because of the fact that that we sexualize our women. But then I said that I grew up, I'm, I'm 72 years old. When I grew up, it was common. It was common in Chicago when I grew up on the south side. You get on the bus, a woman would have her breasts out. On the bus, feeding her baby. We did not think about a woman's breasts. We did not think a woman was sexy just because she showed her breasts or she was nude. Because they always taught us, they always taught us in the sense is that in school, they always taught you those are the primitive women. So we thought we thought a woman was sexy when she had a bikini or or a negligee. I mean, just being nude, uh, everybody could be nude. But that's just the way it was. But so so we had this disagreement. But the thing is, this is that the thing is, this is that as as Janice said, is that we were weaving cotton. How, how do you think? How do you think they set up those factories in England? They didn't know how to weave any cotton. Right. They yeah. got cotton from from us. Yes. They got cut from you, family. They yeah. got cut from you. And, and 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 that's the whole point is that you guys need to know. You need to know your history. You need to get your history books. You have to begin. You have to begin with African history. Since you have to begin with African history, I know Sister Shanice, she's a very modest person, very modest woman, but she's got, you got to get that book, The Remarkable Accomplishments of Ancient African Civilizations, a short book. It gets right to the point. It talks about our, our African civilizations. It talks about our contributions to history. Well, you got to get this book. Your child, I'll tell you, if your child gets this book, and when your child is looking at those pictures, they're going to be able to envision themselves. You know, that's just like when I was in fifth grade, I decided to be a great historian. And the reason I decided to be a great historian is that I could picture in my mind's eye. I could picture being one of those explorers selling them those ships. And see, that's what it is, is that when you get Sister Shanice's book and your children get to see those pictures, beautiful pictures, beautiful illustrations, when they see those things, they're going to be able to, to see themselves. And that's what you want them to do. Stop allowing your children to get to join gangs and, be, and do negative things because of the fact that they feel that, oh, that's what the rappers say. That, but that's what the rappers say, but that's not our culture. Mm -hmm. That's not mm -hmm. your culture. Mm -hmm. You have a great culture. Mm -hmm. You have a great culture. But see, mm -hmm. we're always allowing other people to define our culture for us. And that's why we got people like Sister Shanice, who can share with you through her book, The Remarkable Accomplishments of Ancient African Civilization. You can find it at Amazon.com. It's worth it's, mm -hmm. it's worth more than the money that that, that she's charging, you know. I had so much fun writing the book as well. You know, it just 
you come away from it feeling 10 feet tall because, you know, quite often our children, they're looking for themselves in the history books when they're in school. Right. They're looking for knowledge <laughs> of, you know, what our people actually uh, accomplished and achieved. And it's so difficult for them to find it because we are deliberately hidden uh, and removed from the pages of history. But what this book does and what the works of Dr. Winters and others does is it puts us in the picture. You know, it writes us into the history of time. And what a phenomenal journey we have had as Africans. Oh, my days. We are just the greatest, but we don't know because, you know, as I said, it's just been hidden from us. And so it's wonderful when we get these presentations because, you know, we can see how we dress. We can see how our women dress, how some of the garments that they wore, even if they just had necklaces on. We can see, you know, the beads that they made, the shells that they used to make their necklaces. We can see the way they decorated their their bodies. And, you know, and like you said, even today in Africa, you know, women will just get their breasts out and feed their babies and there's nothing sexual about it. It is, you know, a mother nurturing her child. And, you know, we... I was walking through the um down the street in in London and we could hear these babies babies screaming and making so much noise and then you know me and my partner we turned to each other and we said you know what you hardly hear a baby cry in Africa because they're on their mother's back and so contented so contented you hardly hear them cry but in London, we're supposed to be, you know, modern and up with the times. And so we're pushing the child in a pram and the child is on its own. It doesn't feel the comfort and the warmth of the mother in the pram. It's feeling the cold of, from all the elements and it's crying, you know, crying and crying. <laughs> and they teach you and they teach you that uh, they teach you and it says that you're supposed to let the baby cry. Like my wife, I, 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 my, I believe my, my wife was crazy about me. I know that, but, but, and, and a lot of people get upset whenever we had a baby, the baby came first. That, that was just it. You know, now you, now you hear these uh, men in the manosphere. Oh, if you get a woman, she's putting the baby. Yeah, the baby comes first. That's the baby come first. I mean, there are many, and many a night, many a night I'd turn over and look in the bed and, and there was, there was a, this, there was a kidney, you know, on that breast. Yeah, why can't I be? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because but it, but it's better because when when you when you're nursing your child, you don't mm -hmm. have to get up. You don't have to get up because see, back when my wife when, when when my wife when we were young and we were having children, she always had a rocking chair. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times they wake up in the middle of the night and you had to rock her, you know. Mm -hmm. So then and then you know, but but it was easier because see, a lot of times at night you know you want to get some sleep, put the baby mm -hmm. in there, and then if the breast is next to the baby. Baby can yeah. get nervous anytime they're ready. And see, this yeah. is the whole point is that we're not allowed, we're not allowed to be our natural selves. We're mm. not allowed, we're not allowed to even love each other. You just mm. don't know how what I mean, family, is that it's so sad that that a lot of people, I hear a lot of brothers say, Oh yeah, you know, all of these feminist women. No, it's not the feminist women, it's not feminism that made our women think the way they think. It was our, it was my mama. My mama, because my mama told my sisters, a man, you can't trust a man, a man is a hoe. Now I'll admit, my daddy was light skinned, he had gray eye, had gray eyes, and 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 and, and you know how women are with eyes. I mean he couldn't help but be a hoe. But the point is this is that my mother told told my told my sisters, you can't trust a man, you gotta get a job, you gotta go to school, blah, 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 blah. And so then that's why it's very difficult. And that's why you find today, I don't know about over there, but over here, that's what mothers taught because a lot of times my father and other fathers, they just they just overlorded the women and they made the women, they made their wives feel like you're not working, so I'm the boss. And, and it made mothers say they wanted to help their children, their daughters to be able to survive. But the only problem is, is that it was uh it was uh 10, 11 of us, and out of out of my sisters. Out of, out of five sisters, I only got one sister that was able to stay married. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, they've got children, but mm -hmm. they, you know, I mean, because see, mm -hmm. most men, most men cannot take, most men in a sense, if you're an independent woman, it's easy to tell a, a, an independent woman, see, you don't want to be here. See, that's mm -hmm. the beauty of it. But see, when women tell men that they're independent, 
then it allows that man to feel good to use you. For example, look at the movies. In the movies, they usually have two types of women. They have the black, the one with black hair or brown hair, and the one with blonde hair. The, the one with blonde hair, oh, she's always so weak, and she always needs some help. <laughs> but yeah. then that white woman with the with the black hair brown hair, she's strong. She can do it. She don't need it. She's ready to give up her man. Yeah. And, and yeah. so then so then the blonde lady gets the man, and then the, mm -hmm. the, the, the lady with dark hair is left by herself. And see, that's the way it is, is that it's nothing wrong. It's nothing wrong, I'm telling you. It's nothing wrong with demanding your man to be different with you. It's nothing wrong. Like my wife, she told me, she said, Clyde. I said, I want you to do this, this, that, this, that, this, that, this, and that. She said, okay. Well, she said, I want you to do this. She said, you cheat on me, don't you ever, don't you ever, don't you ever ask me for forgiveness. Because if you cheated on me, you cheated on me. And she said, if you cheat on me, it's not going to be the same. And she said, if you cheat, if you cheat on me, I'm going to know because you're going to act different. So you just remember, you get all of me now. But if you cheat on me, it's not going to be the same. So what could I do? Plus, he talked about a burning bed. I don't want to wake up in, on fire. So, <laughs> but the thing is, this is that is that we need to allow brothers. We need to to allow our women to know how much we care about them. But we all been taught. I don't know about over there, but I, I can only talk about growing up in America. Growing in my in America, there used to be a show that used to come on called Amos and Andy. I see Amos and Andy. They used to have some, you know, some some chugging and jiving on it. And then, and then on Ames and Andy, they all, uh, the guy's name, his wife was called Sapphire. And so then, so then my father said, you don't want to get no Sapphire. Cause you know, she was always arguing and yelling at her man. Uh -huh. and so see, so a lot of yeah. times, a lot of times black men, at least, at least black men in America, a lot of times we grow up thinking that, uh, thinking that if our, if our woman argue at us, oh, she acting like our mother. No, <laughs> you did something wrong, Nick. You did something wrong. You did something mm -hmm. wrong. And she's telling you what you did wrong. But we'll say, mm -hmm. oh, stop acting like my mama, blah, blah, blah. See, no. See, it is very hard. It's very hard. And you know, I, I really don't, I really think in a sense is that instead, instead of calling, instead of in a sense playing up this husband thing, we should be talking about partners and real partnership. And I think, and I think that I think that if you're in a relationship where you're partners, you see. Mm -hmm. Because when I met my wife, you know, I, I told my wife, and she said, do you love me? I said, no, I don't love you. I said, because uh, love is a state of mind. You know, back then they used to say, you always hurt the one you love. I said, they always say, love is never having to say you're sorry. I said, do you want that, me hurting you because you love me? Do you want that, 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 uh, that, that I can't say I'm sorry? I said, no. So I said, but if I respect you and you respect me, then therefore I'm not going to hurt you because, and I don't want you to hurt me because I respect you and you respect me. So I said, we start with respect. Then the love can come because he loves the state of mind. I mean, I said to her, I said, baby, I said, how many boyfriends did you have before you met me? Uh, about four or five, something like that. I said, how many did you uh, love? Oh, I loved them all. I said, see, where are they today? Mm -hmm. See, I said, I said, as a man, as a man, I might I might tell my sisters and I might tell my mother and my grandmother and aunties that I love you. But as a man, a man will only tell maybe one or two women his entire life that he loves them. Usually only maybe one or two unless he's at a bar and, and the lady looks good and, and uh, you think you might get some sex. Oh, yeah, I love you. <laughs> but then again, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't. <laughs> but again, but other than that, in the sense is that you know, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because we're always, instead of us allowing ourselves to love each other, we're always mm -hmm. trying to uh, protect ourselves. You know, sister mm -hmm. trying to protect herself because, you know, mm -hmm. daddy was a hoe or, or, or daddy left mama. So so she's trying to protect herself from not being hurt. And then in, in, in her trying not to be hurt, she's still hurt. And then mm -hmm. the man, he trying to make sure in a sense that, that, he, that, that he don't have anybody telling him what to do. But that's a big mistake because I'm going to tell you. Brothers out there, sisters, y'all just be quiet. I ain't talking to y'all. I won't tell the secret to the brothers. Cover your cover your ears. <laughs> Listen, brother. Thank you. Listen, brother. You need somebody to tell you the truth, so you want to keep acting up. 
<laughs> See, so many of us, so many of us, we do stupid things. And, and, and when you don't have nobody to tell you that you're doing stupid things, you keep doing stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. I knew I, I know I did a lot of stupid things because I knew if I told my wife, this is what I after a while I started doing this. After wife, after a while I say, damn. If uh yeah, I want to do this, and I say, well, I want should I tell Diane? If I had to say, if I had to say, should I ask her, it must not shouldn't be done. And you know what? I found that when you allow your woman, when you allow that black woman to tell you, see, nobody can love a black man like a black woman. Yes, 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 yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you feel you feel you got a white woman. You feel you have made it. You feel you're on top. Look at that sister who was up from the Caribbean. I'm mean, being from London. She married that white guy bragging about, oh, she's going to have some light-skinned babies. You know, and then he, and he, I knew it wasn't going to work because they took a picture with him with his clothes on and her naked. Who wanted, who wanted anybody to see that white naked? You know, you remember that actress. And now they're getting a divorce. See, because see, a white man and a white woman. Now today, today in America, some some black kids and white kids, they go to school from, from kindergarten on up together. But to me, I don't think a white man or a white woman can love a black man or love a black woman because they've been they've been taught that they're superior to you. They've been taught that you're inferior to them. And they've been taught in the sense that they should always be your master. You cannot have a partner who wants to be your master. You cannot have your partner who, who wants to be, a, be your master. You see, partners, partners have to listen. And that, you know, that's the hardest thing for a man and woman to do is to listen. See, it, it's very hard for a man to listen because the point is this, is that he's afraid if he listen, sister, you're going to tell him the truth. But brother, listen to your woman. You, you'll stay out, you, you'll have less troubles and, and, and you'll lose less money and, and you won't always be, what am I talking about? Anyway, let's change the subject. <laughs> no, it's a, good, it's a good subject. And uh, everyone in the audience, please do listen to Dr. Clyde. He's a man who had well over 50 years uh, of a, uh, in a beautiful relationship. And so, you know, for someone to be in a relationship for over 50 years, we thank you so much for sharing, you know, the secret ingredients to what makes a successful relationship. Well, you know, here in the UK, it's not too dissimilar to what you've described uh, in America. You know, um, we in the UK, we had our parents, most of us from the 50s, 60s, who came over uh, from Jamaica. And they had us here uh, as young children, but they allowed us to adopt the Eurocentric culture, you know, because they were made to feel that their culture and everything that they stood for was inferior and that the European culture was superior. And so, you know, we were fed the idea of, of a relationship by Hollywood and by what, you know, we saw on the TV, in the magazines, you know, we were fed their images of beauty and, and, you know, we were fed the idea that, you know, you'd be in love and you'd go swanning off, you know, into the sunset with this happy every after relationship, you know, so the reality of life wasn't really there. And the other thing that we didn't realize that was very tragic as well is, um, you know, the imp- importance of family. The importance of a family was never hammered home to us as children and as young people. And this is what should have happened as children and as young people, like your father did, you know, he prepared you for manhood. He prepared you so that you knew what your role and responsibilities were expected to be as a man. And this is what the parents should have been doing, preparing us as children to become the woman of tomorrow, the man of tomorrow within that relationship, within that household and what it would take for that relationship to work. And of course, you know, that wasn't instilled into us at home or in school or through the Eurocentric system because they wanted to destroy the black family. You take the man out of the family or you make the woman independent. You do whatever it takes to destroy the black family. You destroy the black family. You destroy the black community. You destroy the black community. You destroy the black nation. And so Unfortunately, because, you know, we were one step, two step removed from our culture and we didn't have our own culture in terms of our relationship. You go to Africa, it's very family orientated. The cornerstone key to life in Africa is the family. 
the woman, she gets married and she has her children and her babies. And her job is to nurture and to bring up those children and to look after her husband. And yes, the black woman, she can bring the best out of the black man. I mean, sometimes when I see some of these brothers with some of these white women, unfortunately, you know, they just allow them to be whatever. They don't care what they look like. They could have their trousers ran by their their knees. They're not even going to tell them to pull their trousers up because, you know, they want to denigrate our race. They don't want to see the black man rise. Whereas the black woman now, she'll bring the best out of the black man because she'll say, you know what, my babes, you know what, King? Well, how about you try this? How about you try that? That looks good on you. Hey, look at you. You You know, generally bring the best out of them you know because we want them to be the king that they have the potential to be and then you know like you said in the relationship respect is so important and to be able to humble yourself be the man humble and the woman be humble to each other you know and realize that you're in it for the long haul for the children's sake to bring the future generations into the world to see your grandchildren running around your feet oh my gosh you know we should have that we should all be looking forward to that but they had us looking forward to a job looking forward to promotion looking forward to a career putting off you know um committing into a relationship you know we were really screwed up in terms of the family, building families. Because that's, that's how true. they destroy the nation. That's true. And, and and as a sister, you see, just like, just like, you know, we don't, over here, you know, uh, what was it, uh, Booker T. Washington, I think he was, and he said that, that Black people like crabs because we try to pull each other down. And see, mm -hmm. we knew that. African people knew that. That's why they had an initiation societies where the boys at a certain age, they all they all came together. They learned about how to be men. The girls yes. at a certain age, they learned how to be women. And so what you did is that you not only learned about life, but you got lifelong friendships. And mm. see, most of us, most of us, we're afraid to be uh, friends. You tell the mm. sister, well, if you be friends with her, she don't try to take your man, girl. Yeah. So you got to watch out for her. And then if you're a brother, you know, uh, you know, you got to use, you got to use your women. You got to use it. You know mm. I mean? I mean, just like when you when you growing up in, in in America, your father always saying, uh, uh, "Have you had sex yet?" Uh, you know they don't want you to be gay. Have you had sex yet? I mean, uh, I'm not getting in your business. Are, are you a man or are you? A... And, so then, and it's hard to see because, see, to me, it's good that you could have had those sorts of conversations with your father. The Caribbean mothers and fathers didn't discuss sex at all. That wow. was like a taboo subject. It's like, if you ask your mom something, you know, to, a, a question in relation to sex, it's like, just don't ask me nothing, man. You will find out soon enough. <laughs> well, you know, I mean... Uh, we didn't talk about it. I'm, I'm going to go to the chat in a little while, okay, Dr. Oh, Clive, to bring in the audience. One minute. Go in yeah. I just want to say this is that anybody put a question, put question, and then write your question, in the chat, put question, then write your question after you write the word question. Then uh, Shanisa know that you're talking, that you have a question. If you got questions, you can ask them now. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for that. I, I think it's really good talking about um, relationships because it's so, so important. And uh, Baba Kwame Oboje agrees. He says, I love African women. 100% Baba Winters. Right on, right on. And uh, he's rising up. Baba, uh, brother Kwame Ossi from Nottingham in the audience as well. Rise up, rise up. I want to thank Brother Timbo. He sent uh, a five dollars uh, uh, gift to us. Oh, thank you so much. He said, "United States of Africa, B one." Absolutely, Timbo. Thank you so much for that gift. And he also said, "What's up, sister? What's up, dog? I'm about to head to Doc's Patreon to print two more slides. I got your paper. Oh, awesome! Uh, one of your Patreons." in the house. Brother Kimani is saying to you, uh, Dr. Clyde, excellent guidance. And, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you've got to, you've, I'm so happy that you share your wisdom. As I said, you know, you're, you're someone who has 
had a uh, 50 plus years in a relationship yes yeah, share with the brothers what it takes share with them you know um the joy and the love that you've got within that relationship and how you managed to build that relationship and what made it special oh uh, yeah and uh you know probably also say you know probably uh, a body say you are so funny <laughs> dr winters you are we love you so much uh probably also says uh is it any wonder there is a high percentage of african women from the caribbean who are single mothers oh uh, why why <laughs> Tap, drop drop that why is it uh let's uh, share your thinking a bit more on that uh That's you can go if you go if you go from if you go from 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 Maine in the United States down to the tip of of South America, you're going to find women, a lot of single mothers. This came from that from slavery because they taught us they taught us during slavery that we should just remember the word motherfucker. We got the word motherfucker because see, in in states like Maryland, they would put a bag over the man's uh, head and he and they would make him have sex with his sisters with his mother. And so then we always been conditioned that and see, most men, I'm gonna tell you this, most men are afraid of love. The average sister who has a baby, she don't have a baby just because she's a whore. She had a baby because she loved that guy and that guy loved her. That guy loved her and let's just face it. If you love somebody and they leave you, then it's kind of hard to really love somebody else. And then sometimes you may, you may not, you may, Meet a person who could be better than that person who hurt you, but you don't know that because you're thinking about how you were hurt. You see, like a like you know that's the way it is. But I believe I don't believe that women have babies just because they want to have a baby when they're young. They have babies because some guy said they loved them, and he mm -hmm. acted like he loved her. And then when it came time to be a man, he had to leave. But my mm -hmm. father taught me. He said he said Clyde. He said that. Yo, a man does not leave. A man does not flee his woman. A man does not leave his woman. A man stays there no matter what. And I remember I lived in a building when I grew up at 741 East 47th Street. It's about what, four or five? It's about, uh, it was a real big building. And it was about 18, it was about 24 apartments. And out of those 24 apartments, it was children in just about every one of them. But my, but, I was the only one that had a father that was there every day. My father was there. The rest of them were, were single mothers, you know. But the difference back in the day was is that it was uncles around. It was uncles around. No granddads. We didn't have no granddads. All the granddads, they died back down south. They died playing dice and getting in trouble. No, none of us had grandfathers. My, kid, my kids, they got to meet my father as a grandfather. I'm a grandfather. But when I was growing up, Nobody, it wasn't no grandfathers around. A lot of grandmas, them grandfathers, they died young. You know, just died young, just doing stuff. That was the way it was in, in America, you know, because when you got old, you was an uncle. But see, the whole point is this to see, brothers, what you have to understand is that you shouldn't just tell girls that you love them and then leave them. You shouldn't give them babies. And see, we got those single babies because we learned during slavery that, that mama, that the sister going to take care of that baby. And that's, that's why you find even among Latinos, even mm -hmm. among Latinos, you'll find the same type of activity, even though they be Catholics. In, in fact, growing up in America, in the black church, in the black church, they never talked about fornication. No, they, you never mentioned fornication in the black church. Mm -hmm. Because, see, if you mention fornication, all the women go have to leave. Because a lot of people had babies when they were teenagers. But this is this is a symptom of, of the of the slave culture that existed mm -hmm. from Maine in in North America all the way down to Chile. Sorry. It's from that slave Sorry culture. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, that ringtone came through on my phone a bit too loud. Uh my apologies. So yeah, so relationships and discussing relationships is so, so important. And what we're taught as young people as well, it stays with us, doesn't it? Yes, it yes. stays with us and it impacts 
on our own relationships and also uh, the household and the relationships within the household impacts us as well because you said you grew up with your father in your household one of the few you know household the only household in your block that had a father in a house and so you you know saw and knew and grew to understand the responsibility of having a father uh, around as well. And you were there as a father for your children. And, you know, it brings so much balance, doesn't it, into the lives of children when they have both mother and father, you know, giving them that that care and support and love and joy, you know, that they can get from two people. You know, it's, it's beautiful. And so, yeah, we want to encourage all of our men, you know, be one, black first, you know, there's black men, black women, white men, white women, Chinese men, Chinese women, you know, Indian men, Indian women. And it, we're made like that for a reason. Come on now. Kwame in his, in, is saying in his chat that uh, where he lives in Nottingham, 70% of black men are with white women and 40% of black women with white men we are bleaching ourselves out of existence you know and uh, this is not by accident it's by design you know we this is what we are being encouraged to do you cannot turn up turn on the tell live vision and see an advert with a black man in it and him not being with a white woman you cannot find you know them promoting any black men on the tell live vision as celebrities footballers entertainers or what have you that doesn't have a white woman on their arm why because they know three generations and we can go from black to white look at argentina yeah. Yeah, and three I'm generations never... and you wouldn't even know that child's got a black grandfather yeah. you see but we're giving them our genes we're giving them our greatness we're giving them our geniusness you know yeah. we and 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 then we wonder why we are where we are <laughs> and in america in america now every commercial you re you'll see two white people together but in commercials over here, it's always a black man and a white woman, or a white man and a and a uh, and a and a black woman. You know, yeah. they're trying to slowly, but see, the only yeah. thing, the only thing is, this is that one of the reasons why not that many foundational black Americans marry white white people, white men, but women, the men might, but women don't, because you mm -hmm. you know you, you got at least an auntie, you got at least an auntie who was raped. By, by the white man when, when she was working in his house. So you got no. a great aunt who was raped. And so since you since you know a great aunt was raped, many, many foundational black American women do not trust white men because they know they're beasts. They're beasts. And and the thing is this is that just the evil, look at what's going on today. Look how white people treat each other. So you know how they're gonna treat a sister. Oh my gosh, just look to Israel and, and Palestine right now to yeah. see how they're treating each other. Two white people, oh two white people fighting each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah, and look, look how they exterminate California, yeah. like like Chicanos. It wasn't no Chicanos in no California. California mm -hmm. was full of black Indians. You can't find no black Indians now. You know why? They mm -hmm. used to pay. They used to pay. They would pay two dollars for a male Indian scout. Scout. The government, California government, mm -hmm. they would pay in a sense five dollars for for a kid scout and seven dollars for 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 a woman to scout. Mm -hmm. And that's why they exterminated. The government paid these bounties. And so, you mm -hmm. know, they, they can make more money by killing the women. So they kill women and children. That's mm -hmm. why, that's why I see what they did in America is this is that, that the most of the Aboriginal Americans were all black. But what, mm -hmm. what, what they did began with Frederick, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Benjamin Franklin, is they started sending these white people, these uh, Mongoloid Indians, and then tell them to take our names. You know, that's why That's why they'll tell you now, you go right now to North Carolina and Virginia, you hear black people say, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a Blackfoot. I'm a Blackfoot Indian, you know, like my, my, uh, my wife, her grandmother was, her grandmother on her father's side was a Blackfoot. But if you go, if you put into, a, if you put into Google right now, they gonna say all the Blackfoot Indians live in Canada. No, see? But they, but it's just this, this lie. Just like, just like it was wonderful that you tried to bring to the, to the family about the black Irish, and and down in Jamaica. See, 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 they, they made, they made Jamaicans feel like, they made Jamaicans feel like over here, like how American Indians feel on a reservation. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. made many dark, especially they made many dark Jamaicans 
feel as though they don't they don't have nothing to contribute. They yeah. don't feel they have anything to history, so they get into ganja or some other stuff to try mm-hmm. to stay high. No, mm-hmm. that's why we need this research. They need to know their mm-hmm. ancestry. See, mm-hmm. they need to go. We they need to know that they have an illustrious history, and their history is not just dependent on that European mm-hmm. coming to Jamaica. See, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no, they mm-hmm. have a great history. You see, yes. but it's, it's very difficult. Get that book. Get get Sister Nisa's book. Let your kids <laughs> yes, see it. and they'll be proud of themselves. They'll be proud. Yes, they they will. Have pride. Kwanzaa's coming up. Christmas is coming up. Yeah, get, the, get book, the book. Put it in there. Yeah. In their stocking or whatever you do, give them a gift. It'll be a gift for life because especially when you give uh, young people um, a good book to read when they're young, it stays with them for life. And if we can inspire them, if we can elevate their minds, if we can instill that greatness into them from now, it will stay with them for life indeed. Uh, well, we we yeah, are King five minutes away. Sorry, sorry. I told him to get King Offer too. Get get that oh, one too. Oh, King Offer! Wow, wow, wow! You know, don't get me started on King Offer. But yes, family, uh, that's my other book. A Black King of Anglo-Saxon Britain, Anglo-Saxon England. Imagine, you know, we had kings who ruled this country. We had rulers who were of African origin because we were the original people of Britain and of Europe. But like how they're trying to obliterate the Palestinians today, they successfully obliterated, almost successfully obliterated us out of uh, history uh, right. in this part of the world. But we are uncovering the truth and we're realizing that we are the indigenous people of this part of the world, the original right. people, you know, the original builders, the original ones that built the civilizations here. And uh, yeah, it's been uncovered now. They almost successfully buried our history when they exterminated half of our people and shipped the other half out to America and uh, to the Caribbean on their newly established plantations. <laughs> and the wow. greatest, and the, and the, and the greatest, the, the greatest, the greatest person, is the greatest scholar today to me is Sister Marie Charles, because Marie, oh. Charles, Marie Charles has taught us, all taught us about the ancestry of the uh, foundational Black Britons. She's taught mm-hmm. us about, she even had me, had, I had to start to look at the fact that there was many Black Irishman, because I, one of my students, his name is Torin. And uh, Torin, his father always told him, his father always told his grandfather father and all of them said that they were Irish, you know. And and he and he said, damn, uh, Irish, uh, look in the mirror. But see, now we know, now we <laughs> know from it. Sister Denise, they were Irish. They this were Black Irish. Yeah, the original people of the land of Ireland were indeed uh, Black people. Yes, and you know what, Dr. Dr. Clyde, I'm glad you've mentioned Dr. Marie. She is going to be our guest next Wednesday. Ah, yeah, that's wonderful. This is the new show. Yeah. yeah. She's going to she's be got... talking about the original Black people of, of Scotland. Yeah. So, she's going to, yes. she's going to be with us tomorrow. She's going to be, uh, she's going to be uh, with me and our Dr. Uh, Dr. Shock tomorrow. So you guys uh, look oh. up Dr. Shock. Matthews and uh, Marie Charles is going to be there. We're going to talk a little while. It's not going to be as good as the one that she. When we get these, when we get these two scholars together, you know, <laughs> Doctor 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 Lindsay, Doctor Lindsay, Shanice Lindsay. We get Doctor Shanice Shanice Lindsay and Doctor Doctor Marie Charles. Can you imagine next week's show is going to be fantismo? She's gonna, oh, she's going to blow our minds with the research. Yeah and the artifacts that she's uncovered and uh, the history that she's uncovered about uh, Scotland because she goes deep. She locks herself away. She does the works and she goes deep. Absolutely phenomenal. I mean, she really just awakened my appetite for researching Ireland. And I know she's going to just awaken my appetite now uh, for Scotland because we've got a huge amount of history there as well. A great history. The best of which is yet to be told. 
Wow, family in the chat. The time, as always, has just absolutely flown by. Uh, I want to thank all of you in the chat for your comments, for the conversations that you've been having, you know, amongst yourself, within between each other, and for all the compliments that you've been sending to Baba Winters and uh, the love, the love in the chat. You know, for you, uh, Bubba Winters, excellent presentation. Bubba Winters, uh, did we uh, invent rum? He says, oh, yes, you know. You know we did. You know we did. <laughs> you know we did. <laughs> and uh, uh, uh says, I share Bubba Winters. Everything started with that, with African history. And Shanice, yes, I need your book. Hey, your book's on its way. <laughs> your book's on its way. And, uh, yeah, um, uh, JKB's was saying any info on Grand Canyon we're going to have to come back to that one because of time and let me just quickly rush down to the bottom and see uh what we've got that's recently just come in oh lots of big ups a lot of big ups for you Kwame Ossie the name Escus for Scotland is named after an African queen think about it so Excuse, well, we're going to hear uh, more about uh, that as well. Because remember, we've got Scotia, Queen uh, Scotia as well, who Scotland's meant to be named after. So, yeah. And yes, Africans got the uh, Celtic in them as well from both Scotland and Ireland. Oh, and I saw earlier we've got Roshi in the house as well. Roshi, who done the fabulous um, works for you. Wonderful video, intro video. Wonderful tune. So well done. Well done to Yoshi. Rise yourself up. Uh, keep up the great work. So he sent me some visuals as well that look really, really exciting. Dr. Winters, as always, it's an absolute pleasure and honor. You know, our family, you'll be pleased to know we've managed to pin him down for a date in December. <laughs> oh, so we're looking. We got a treat coming up for December, December as well. And, um, you know, we love your unique style. We love the humor that you integrate into your presentations. We love the works and the research that you put into it. That's why my audience are always saying, you know, bring back Dr. Winters. We want to hear more from Dr. Winters. So thank you so much. Thank Everybody you. in the chat. Wow. Final word from you, please, Dr. Winters. All I got to say is that I love you. I love you, family. I love being with, with, with Sister Shanice. Because I love being with a woman who loves her people and loves herself, loves her partner and loves her daughter. And, it, and, and she not only can love them, but she loves us too. So thank you, Sister Shanice, for giving us, giving us all of you, not a piece of you, all of you. And I'm going to tell you what, I didn't get this, I didn't get this back, but now I'm greedy. I'm greedy for that. I'm greedy for the knowledge that Sister Shanice gives us. Everybody have a great day. See you in December. Thank you. We love you so much to family, to everyone in the audience. Thank you so, so much for contributing towards making the show what it has been tonight. Keep it locked. We'll see you tomorrow over at the Dr. Philippe Shock Matthews site. And I'll see you back here next Wednesday. Take care, family. Bye for now.